Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMin 2024. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Andy Zhang, a PhD student in the group of Amin Zinger at Princeton University, who will talk about CAMS method, uh, metrics and beyond. Over to you, Andy, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Andy. I'm a current third year in a mid uh, singers group, and uh, my presentation aims to give you a survey of CAMS method. So we'll discuss first uh, cryo-EM and what the reconstruction problem is in cryo-EM. And then we'll discuss uh, CAMS method and how it can be used for reconstruction. And then we'll discuss uh, our most recent paper, which is uh, using CAMS method to do moment matching and make a metric between molecules, uh, molecules for molecular symmetry. And then uh, lastly, we will discuss uh, future steps in CAMS method. What is single particle cryo -EM? So here we have a schematic drawing of the imaging process. The key idea is that we have a protein. We want to try to solve for the structure of the protein. And the way a cryon, uh, cryo -EM, uh, machine works, a cryo electron microscope, is that we have multiple samples of this protein. We freeze in a thin layer of vitreous ice. And here we can see that we have an electron beam, shoots electrons through. And at the bottom, we have a receptor can uh, detect uh, the diffraction pattern of the electrons. And through this process, we get multiple images like these, where we have projection images of the proteins. This uh, specific image is a very idealized case. You can see that all of the proteins are very clearly visible in the image. And our main problem in cryo-EM is a standard 3D reconstruction problem, where if we're given multiple of these images, we want to solve for a 3D structure. So now you might think this is very similar to uh, computerized tomography, where we also have different projections and we want to solve for a structure. There are two main differences, however. The first of which is that in tomography, we know what angle we're taking projections at. Here, uh, when we freeze the protein in ice, it solves some motion blur issues by locking the protein in place. Prior to being frozen, we don't know what orientation the protein adopts. So when we're shining the electron beam through it, we don't know what viewing angles we're taking projections at. So that's a big issue there. We don't know, uh, we have to do some rotation estimation to find the viewing angles. And the second main issue with cryo-EM is that there's very high noise. So when we shoot electrons through, we don't want to shoot too many of them, otherwise we risk damaging the protein. So we have to use very low dosage electrons. And because of this, we'll see a very uh, high noise in our images. So to illustrate that, have a couple experimental noisy images. Uh, Andy, uh, could I ask about the previous slide, which is a yeah, very nice schematic illustration. Approximately, how many proteins uh, do you have frozen in that layer? Do I'm not you... sure exactly because I don't work on the experimental side. I think of the images and the particles that we pick, uh, we can get upwards of, I don't know, like 100,000. 100,000 uh, proteins in different orientations. Uh -huh. And you assume that this is the same rigid conformation, but uh, only in, in, yeah, in different orientations. Yeah, so there's also a separate uh, unrelated issue that I won't talk about in this talk, where we can also assume that the protein can adopt various conformations. So that's what we call the heterogeneity problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the simplicity of this talk, we will ignore that issue and assume that every uh, protein that we have is adopting the same uh, confirmation. Okay, thank you. So here we have some experimental noisy images, and we can see that it's uh, pretty much impossible for the naked eye to tell where these proteins are. So we just described the schematic process of uh, how electron microscopes take images of proteins. But what does this mean mathematically? So we can see we have a simplified uh, schematic again. We have a molecule phi, uh, which encodes the electrostatic potential of our protein or molecule. We have an electron source that shines electrons through, and then we have a projection image that we obtain I sub I. So mathematically, to form the image, we have each image is equal to a point spread function, little h of I involved with a projection taken at an unknown rotation 
of our electrostatic potential of our molecule, plus epsilon of i, which we call white Gaussian noise. And um, oftentimes when we analyze these images, we want to move to Fourier space. And this is because of three reasons. The first of which is that if we do a convolution in real space, it becomes a multiplication in Fourier space. So that saves us time from having to do a costly convolution operator. So now instead of convolving by the point spread function, little h of i, we now multiply by its Fourier transform, which is the contrast transfer function, h of i. The second thing that the Fourier transform makes nice is the projection operator. So using the Fourier slice, trans uh, Fourier slice projection theorem, the Fourier transform of projection at, taken at an unknown rotation is the same as taking a slice of the Fourier transformed uh, volume at a uh, plane that is perpendicular to the viewing direction. And lastly, if we have white Gaussian noise, the Fourier transform of white Gaussian noise is still white Gaussian noise. Andy, uh, so on this slide, um... R i is um, is a matrix, right? Yes. Uh huh. And and P is is probably another matrix. Uh, project the projection operator here. Uh huh. Yeah, projection operator. Uh, H i you said it's um, blur blur a uh, spread function, right? Spread function. So this is basically the, uh, a Gaussian bell shape function. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. with a certain deviation. Yeah. So here uh, you use, um, ah, so in this model, right, so in this model you have several parameters, the noise and um, the spread spread function um, for the Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. But the only, uh, when we do reconstruction, the only molecule, or the only parameter we care about is the molecule right here. And we'll talk a bit more about that with uh, expectation maximization. Uh -huh. I see. So there are several existing uh, methods to do 3D reconstruction. The first of which is common lines. The key idea for common lines is if we can figure out relative rotations, then this problem just becomes a tomographic reconstruction problem. And to figure out the relative rotations, if we consider each projection image and then consider their Fourier transforms, now this represents a plane in 3D Fourier space that goes to the origin. And if we have multiple of these images, we know that two planes will intersect in a line. So here we have a diagram of the two planes intersecting. And this line we'll call the common line. By knowing the common lines of the images, we can solve for the relative rotations. And then we have the unknown viewing angles. So then this problem becomes tomographic reconstruction. We just need to solve for uh, phi, the electrostatic potential, using least squares. So we will take the uh, molecule that minimizes this uh, sum of errors between the images and the projection of the candidate uh, molecule. And the second method that is used for 3D reconstruction, which is widely used in practice and is incorporated into various software uh, packages that people use in practice, is the expectation maximization algorithm. So here we run the expectation maximization algorithm on the image formation model. And uh, like Vitaly said earlier, there are a lot of parameters that are uh, involved in the image formation. But the only one we actually care about here is going to be the electrostatic potential, right? And we want to treat everything else as nuisance parameters. So we don't care about the uh, point spread function, and we don't really care about the relative rotations. And as I said earlier, this is widely used, and people uh, who do cryo-EM in the lab actually use this in practice. And multiple of the software packages that people use uh, have this method incorporated. So now why would we use CAMS method when we have uh, so many uh, existing methods that are used for 3D reconstruction? Well, there are several disadvantages of the methods I described earlier. Common lines, if we have too much, uh, too much noise compared to signal, so low signal to noise ratio, then rotation estimation becomes impossible. And a good way to think about this is that if we had an oracle function, when given a projection image can tell you exactly what viewing angle was it was taken at, if we corrupt the image with enough noise, then even this oracle won't be able to tell you what viewing angle the noisy image was taken at. And then the second issue, uh, the issues with expectation maximization is that it takes a long time. Iteration is very expensive. It's order n a squared l to the fourth log l. Well, here is going to be your image size. It can vary anywhere from 64 up to more than 300. 
hey, here's a number of translational shifts you want to search through. And more often than not, this is going to be uh, related to your image size. And n is your number of images. So this is the uh, amount of proteins that we discussed earlier. And the second issue with expectation maximization is that convergence isn't necessarily guaranteed. If you want to converge to the correct solution, you require a good initialization of what you think the molecule looks like. This brings us to CAMS method. And our motivation for wanting to use CAMS method is that we see that classical 3D reconstruction methods are expensive. They also might fail at high noise because we have to do rotation estimation. So what if we could do all of this reconstruction business without doing any rotation estimation? We could speed up the process and maybe even make it uh, more less sensitive to noise. And the question is, can we do this? And the answer is, yes, we can. And the key idea behind this is using CAMS method. So to understand CAMS method, we will need to discuss a little bit about the statistical method of moments estimator. The key idea behind the statistical method of moments estimator is to associate equal order moments with the parameters that you're solving for. And then in practice, you won't be able to access the analytical moments. So you replace each analytical moment with its sample moment, and then you get estimators by solving for your parameters. So I have a simple example to illustrate this. So let's assume that we have a lot of samples drawn from the uniform distribution. And it's going to be on an interval from A to B. We don't know what the endpoints are. So we don't know what A and B are. If we look at the first and second moments of this variable, the first moment is just going to be the mean, which is the midpoint of A and B. And the second moment is the expectation of our variable squared, which is A squared plus AB plus B squared over three. Using a bit of algebraic manipulation, we can figure out that A is equal to the first moment minus square root of three times the centered second moment. And B is the same quantity, but instead of a minus, you have a plus. And uh, practice, we don't have access to analytical moments, so we need to replace them with the sample moments. So uh, the first moment is going to be replaced with its sample analog, which is the sample mean. And the centered second moment is going to be replaced with its sample analog, which is the uh, sample covariance. So then we get our estimator of A to B, sample mean of X minus three times, the, uh, sorry, square root of three times the covariance of X. And then the uh, estimator for B is the same quantity, but with the plus. So now how do we relate this to CrowEM? Well, first I'll break it up into two steps. I'll define the uh, moments for the images, then I'll relate them to the parameters uh, we want to solve for, in this case, uh, the electrostatic potential. So assuming any distribution of viewing angles over uh, the space of rotations, we can define a probability density rho goes from the space of rotations to real space. And we can then define the first and second image moments as such. The first moment is going to be the expectation for rho of our images, and the second moment is going to be the expectation of our images times this transpose. Andy, uh, could, could I ask what is L here, small L, or Li of X? Uh, AI. L, L. Right. So in, in the first formula for M1, mm -hmm. uh, expectation of L. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, I. Is it the I? Eyes are the are the images. Images. So it's the expectation of of uh of the projections at each a viewing angle described in the um described in the probability density. So technically, there should be like a projection and a rotation operator of the of the volume. But I uh, uh forgive my uh use of notation here okay so this i is technically a, a matrix three by three uh it's a matrix it's your images encoded in a matrix so whatever your volume size is that you want to solve for for your electrostatic potential say that you discretize your machine on a grid of n by n by n oh I and see. the mm -hmm. image size will be n by n because you're taking projections so it's potentially a big matrix Right. Okay. Thank you. And then we can estimate these from images. And the way to do that is pretty simple. All we have to do is just 
uh, take the mean image. And the second moment, we can just take the uh, sample covariance of the images. And before we relate this to the electrostatic potential, we want to simplify the formulas a bit. And to do so, we're going to move to Fourier space and then expand our volume in spherical harmonics. So we discussed why Fourier space is nice because it gets rid of a convolution operator and allows us to do projections fast by using the Fourier transform slice theorem. And uh, the question is, why do we want to move to spherical harmonics? Well, it turns out that if we move to spherical harmonics, it makes uh, the moment formulas nicer, and it also gets rid of one dimension of the moment, which makes them easier to store. So the key idea here is that if we take the Fourier transform potential i hat, and we can expand it using uh, spherical harmonics as our basis functions, and then we'll have expansion functions uh, sorry, expansion coefficients, ALMs, indexed by this k here, which represents radius. And now, instead of solving for by hat completely, we just need to solve for the ALM coefficient. But in the uniform case, what do the moments look like? The first moment is going to be radial due to symmetry. So it's going to be a one-dimensional moment. And it is simply the 0, 0 expansion coefficient indexed by your choice of uh, radial uh, sampling. The second moment is this large thing. It's uh, quite a long formula, but if we use uh, spherical harmonics addition theorems to simplify it, we obtain a dimensionality reduction here. So we can see here that our original second moment was four-dimensional, indexed by two radial components and two angular components. But uh, when we simplify it, it turns out it only depends on the difference between the two angular components. We only need three to describe the second moment, which makes it much easier to store. And the second moment formulaically is going to be some uh, sum of quadratic uh, expansion coefficients terms times a Legendre polynomial. So now you might be wondering, if we have a uniform first and second moment, can we uniquely recover the molecule? And the answer is no. There are several limitations when using the uniform case in only the first and second moments. And the major issue here is that we can only recover the expansion coefficients up to an orthogonal matrix, O sub L. And there are several ways to address this to make the problem uh, more uh, accurate and give you uh, less ambiguity. And uh, there are three of them here. One of them is going to be using a non-uniform viewing angle distribution. And the idea here is that perhaps with a uniform distribution, the moments have uh, aspects that average out. Maybe a non-uniform viewing angle distribution can give you more information. Secondly, we assume uniform distributions. Uh, we can try to develop better priors, and maybe this will help uh, condition the problem to have unique solutions. And then lastly, maybe if we have more moments, perhaps a third or fourth moment, then we can uniquely solve for a molecule. So we'll discuss them in uh, reverse order. So we'll discuss higher order moments first and then move on to priors and then non-uniform viewing angle distribution. So higher order moments actually sound nice and Cam actually shows in his original paper, the second and third moment uniquely determine the molecule. However, there are several things in practice that make the third moment uh, and fourth moment and higher order moments uh, unwieldy. So first of all, we have many techniques that are used to accurately estimate the second moment currently, and they don't work on the third moment. And this is because the first and second moment are matrices, while higher order moments are going to be tensors. And it turns out eigenvalue shrinkage is very important for accurately estimating the second moment in the presence of noise. And we don't have any good eigenvalue shrinkage methods for tensors yet. Secondly, we have many more images required to estimate the moments. So the noise variance scales as a function of what moment you're taking. So for the first and second moment, it's going to scale linearly and quadratically. If you take higher order moments, they're going to scale at least cubically. And this requires many more images to try to average the noise out. And then lastly, the major glaring issue is that uh, higher order measurements are going to be hard to store and process. Uh, so we saw that the first moment was one dimensional and the second moment was three dimensional. The third moment is five dimensional and higher moments are even higher than that. So it's very, uh, very unwieldy to store. Andy, uh, could I clarify with uh, uh, 
claim uh, from CAM that M2 and M3 uniquely determine the molecule. So this uh, uniquely determine, um, so does it mean up to rigid motion um, or in what sense? I think it's uh, compared to here when we have uh, the orthogonal matrix that allows us for, allows many candidate molecules to, well, I, I think it's mostly just in a algebraic sense. So here we don't have, we have ambiguity in terms of the uh, ambiguity in terms of the spherical harmonics expansion coefficients, because any uh, ALMs that satisfy this equation, if we multiply them by an orthogonal matrix, it will also still satisfy this equation. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we include the third moment, that ambiguity goes away. Okay, uh, so so what exactly is uniquely determined by M2 of M3? So it uniquely determines a set of uh, expansion coefficients in spherical harmonics. All, all, all infinitely many of them? Uh, sorry, I'm not all so, infinitely many of the... So M2, could you show again the previous slide? Uh, M2, yeah, with sum. Uh, is it a finite sum or infinite sum? So usually you'll go up to some band limit that you'll mm -hmm. uh, cap the L order, mm -hmm. the order of the zero harmonics at. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, as long as you have sufficiently large images and you uh, have a system that allows for a unique solution, you should be able to get one here. Okay. Yeah. Probably later I'll ask for, for a reference um, to this result, but yeah, no rush. Thank mm -hmm. you. And then if we assume that we're just using the first and second moments, then it's often difficult to obtain reconstructions that are unique. So we need priors to condition on. For example, we can use sparsity. So if we represent the molecule on a sparse basis, what we can do is project, uh, do an alternating projection method between projecting onto a sparse basis and then projecting onto the moment space. And we can actually achieve a sparse basis quite easily. If we assume that our molecule is a mixture of atoms and we represent each atom in a Gaussian blob, we can use a wavelet basis because mixtures of Gaussians are known to be sparse in a wavelet basis. Second method is the homology modeling. Here, if we have a molecule that is similar in structure to the molecule that we're trying to solve for, we can use this to try to help for uh, help resolve ambiguity in the moments. Then lastly, we can also assume a non-uniform distribution as a prior, then uh, re-derive the moment equations to include solving for this viewing angle distribution. So here we have an uh, example of what a viewing angle distribution that's non-uniform looks like. And we'll also try to make some simplifying assumptions, make uh, the problem easier to solve. We'll show... Uh, for each one why it's possible to make the assumptions and how to enforce. So we can first assume that rho is in-plane uniform. The way we can do this is if we have each image, we can clone the image uniformly from 0 to 2 pi. So essentially, we have the image, and then we can rotate it uniformly, 0 to 2 pi, effectively uh, increasing our image size or image amount. And then once we do that, if it's in-plane uniform, then this problem becomes just a viewing angle distribution over a sphere instead of over SO3. So we can also assume that rho is going to be an even distribution on the sphere now. The way we can do that is by taking each image and reflecting it. And then lastly, we will uh, encode this viewing angle distribution also into spherical harmonics coefficients as these BPU expansion coefficients. Now we have to solve for both the ex uh, expansion coefficients for the uh, non-uniform distribution and also the expansion coefficients for the molecule. So what do the equations look like now? Well, they look pretty similar. The first moment is going to be now a sum of term that's still linear in terms of uh, the expansion coefficients for the molecule and is multiplied by a linear term in uh, the expansion coefficients for the distribution. And for the second moment, uh, it's going to determine it's going to be determined by a sum of quadratic expansion terms for the uh, molecule, and still is a surprisingly linear 
in the expansion terms of the uh, distribution. Here, these uh, CLs and NLs are coefficients, or, or sorry, they're constants. So we don't have to worry about them if we're trying to solve for uh, algebraically, if we're trying to solve for the expansion coefficients of either group, either the molecule or the distribution. Oh. All right. This brings us to our most recent paper, which was uh, using CAM's method to do moment matching and form metrics for molecular similarity. This is joint work with several of our postdocs and former postdocs in our lab, as well as my advisor, Mitch Singer. And a high level overview of what this paper provides, we do moment matching to make two metrics, first of which compares two volumes. So for example, let's say we have this purple molecule here, which one of these molecules is it most close, uh, closely looking like? Is it going to be closest to this molecule, this red molecule, or this crimson molecule? And this, I think, is a pretty important metric. People have done similar metrics uh, for volume similarity before. And the second, more interesting metric, in my opinion, is comparing an unknown volume to various known mo volumes. So let's say we don't have knowledge of what this purple structure looks like. We do have its ejection images, and they're noisy and experimentally determined, perhaps. If we have a stack of images like this, then which one of these molecules most likely generated these stacks of images? So it's also worthwhile to discuss some existing metrics of structure similarity. There are two main ones, the first of which is classical Euclidean alignment. And this is uh, just to align two sampled volumes and then take their Euclidean distance. So another, yeah, sorry, uh, Vitaly, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, Andy, thank you. And, uh, could, could you clarify what exactly is meant by volume? I, is it a so-called volumetric image? So a voxel-based image? In our case, it would be uh, voxel-based images. Uh-huh, uh, voxel-based and uh, the value, um, the value at every voxel is simply a, a grayscale intensity or something else? Yeah, in our case, since we're just dealing with electrostatic potential, it would be a grayscale intensity. Uh -huh. uh, so it's a sc scalar discretized uh, function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you're comparing these volumes uh, without um, translations or rotation, so it's simply um, voxel by voxel. Or we, we try to solve for a rotation and a translation. With Euclidean alignment, we try to align, which means that we find the rotation and a translation that uh minimizes the euclidean distance between the two molecules or the two sampled volumes uh, okay so with translation well say integer translation is easy but how do you rotate a, a voxel based image mm -hmm. uh so i'm not too sure what exactly our code does but i can get back to you on that okay uh i assume we do uh something where we uh, project into or we transform into Fourier space and then rotate in there and then trans uh, and then uh, inverse Fourier transform back. Uh huh. Uh, so it, it means uh, produce a smooth function from a discrete image, um, rotate that smooth function and then discretize back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, At least you. that's I, I think that's what we do, although I'm not 100% sure. Okay. So I can I can get back to you and I can send you the if you want to take a look. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So the issue with this is that it's computationally expensive because we have to search through all possible rotations and all possible translations that we want to sample at. And also, most importantly, this only works between two volumes. So when we discussed the cases uh, earlier, we have two cases, one between volumes and one between images and volumes. This is only applicable to the first case. The second method is using Zernike moments. And this is the method that's used in the PDB to do structure similarity search. Uh, and the key idea here is that you can expand your volumes in terms of Zernike polynomials. So instead of what we do, which is expanding in spherical harmonics, they use a different basis. And then they use some machine learning uh, algorithm to uh, learn a score for a structure similarity. So this also only deals with the first case. You need knowledge of both of your volumes. So the first of our metrics is a simple uh, moment matching uh, score. It's a metric between volumes. We call it DB cam here for volume cam. 
And it's defined simply as squared difference between the first met first moment, or sorry, squared difference between the second moment plus lambda, which is a hyperparameter, times the squared difference between the first moment. Here we use rho u to define uh, the uniform distribution for SO3. So we're essentially just taking the uniform first and second moment and then comparing. And to test how well this does, we take a subset of the PDB. Uh, here we do 5,000 structures. And we compute pairwise the distance uh, from our metric. And then we do a 2D embedding cluster uh, molecules. And we here have a uh, picture of what the 2D embedding looks like. And they're colored by a number of atoms. So just from the picture, it's apparent that we do something right and that we're clustering similar amount of uh, similarly numbered atoms molecules together. So we can see that within each cluster, the cl uh, colors are very similar. And then if we visually inspect some of the clusters just by looking at what proteins each uh, point represents, we can see that some of them, uh, a lot of them make sense, so to speak. And this is just because if we look at these molecules down here, we get two uh, membrane proteins. And if we look over here at this cluster, we also get two proteins that look very similar. So moving on to the more exciting part of uh, this paper, in my opinion, what if we have one volume that's unknown? How do we relate this procedure to cryo-EM? Well, we want to compare a stack of cryo-EM images to known molecules. But we want to do so by bypassing the reconstruction process, which is typically costly. So we also want to look at how well CAMS method does in terms of just distinguishing different molecules. And this is a very, this is a nice project to do so because if we do this moment uh, comparison, it's much easier than trying to reconstruct a molecule from scratch. So we want to answer some questions. Can we distinguish between two molecules using their moments? If we can, we do it using experimental data. We use do so even with experimental complication. So our second metric is called DICAM for image cam. And this is a metric from images to a volume. And you'll notice it's very similar to the other metric, except now instead of two volumes, we have experimentally determined moments from a set of images. The way we define this metric is that we take whatever the minimum distance is over all possible sets of viewing directions of the Experimental second moment minus the analytical second moment under that viewing angle distribution, plus the difference between experimental first moment minus the analytical first moment under that viewing angle distribution. So essentially, we're going to try to solve for a uh, distribution that minimizes this distance. And now, how do we do that? So it sounds pretty hard because we have to solve for a distribution over a set of distributions over SO3. Well, it turns out this is going to be a linear least squares problem because of the moment formulas that we saw earlier. If we're comparing, uh, if we're comparing to a known volume, then all of these expansion coefficients for the volumes, these ALMs, are known. So we don't have to worry about them when we're trying to solve for uh, the viewing angle distribution. We only need to solve for the BLMs. And if we do that, we notice that both the first and second moments are linear in terms of the viewing angle distribution. We can write a least squares problem to solve for these. And then with our large images and multiple uh, large images and multiple images, we can use a few tricks in practice to let the scale. So moving on to experimental complications. So why is it hard to get these method of moments approaches working in experimental situations? Well, there are several effects that uh, several effects that ruin the moment estimation. First of which is imperfect centering. So usually, uh, the images that I showed you were all centered, which means that uh, there's no distribution of shifts to take into account that ruin the moments. In actual uh, data. When we select particles, we might not necessarily always have the uh, images centered at the upper center. And then this will uh, bias our moment estimation. The second of which is a uh, second effect that 
uh, ruins moment estimation is junk particles. So when we have a image of several uh, projections, we have to use a particle picker to try to figure out where each molecule is. Sometimes this particle picker will fail and give us sometimes pure noise or sometimes just experimental contaminants that aren't the uh, protein that we want to look, look at. Then because we have these uh, contaminants in our sample images, this is also going to ruin our moment estimation. Uh, the third of which is uh, contrast non-radial contrast transfer function. So if we recall the image formation model, we had a point spread function. Fourier transform was going to be a contrast transfer function. And if this is not radial, we don't have that many tools to deal with it right now. Uh, I think the experimental data set that we chose uh, to test on didn't have too much of this issue. This is being ignored mostly for now. Uh, there's also issues with noise modeling. So we considered only white Gaussian noise up until this point. Sometimes the noise might not be uh, white Gaussian noise. So we might have to consider that as well. And then lastly, we have experiment specific artifacts and scaling ambiguity. Experiment specific artifacts are when uh, two different experiments uh, with the same protein can give you vastly different results just from different hardware and different uh, experimental uh, experimental uh, environments. And lastly, scaling ambiguity uh, it arises from the fact that each image that we have might not be of the same scale, so we have to normalize there. And the issue with normalizing is that we lose the ability to distinguish molecules based on mass. And unfortunately, this is just something that we have to live with. So with all these concerns uh, listed, what is a good data set? Ideally, we want to get rid of many of these sources of errors as possible. So to address experimental concerns, we try to look for a data set with multiple structures to resolve from the same experiment. And ideally, we want a mapping of the images to each structure to be known. That way we can, put, uh, we can sort the images into stacks and then compare uh, the stacks against the reconstructed uh, molecules. So the data set we chose here Empire 10076. And this is a heterogeneity data set, which means that it's a data set with multiple uh, multiple structures, all from the same experiment. So this is uh, uh, relates to something that Ellie said at the beginning, which was, do we assume that they're all in the same uh, conformational state? In this case, uh, we'd have an experiment with multiple conformations. So here we have uh, structures A through E. Uh, in future slides, we'll label them 000 to 004. So A is 00 and E is 004. So we want to look at the uh, image cam rankings, metric rankings for this data set using experimental data. So our first thing is to do is going to compare our uh, the performance of our volume metric, which is here on the left uh, with known volumes and our image metric with images, experimental images on this data set. And here are ground truth structures. So the volume that we're, we have going to be on the y-axis and the candidate molecules we're comparing to are going to be on the x-axis. Notice that the x-axis has two extra molecules. And these are just uh, fake molecules that we selected aren't from the data set. We want to see get high scores. So we want them to be ranked very dissimilar. Oh, sorry. Uh, so one thing just to note is that we see very similar trends in terms of the rows, which is what we want to see, which means that our image metric and our volume metric agree, at least in the trends of how each uh, Canada molecule is ranked in a ground truth molecule. The red square here is uh shows a fallback of our um, uh, image metric on experimental data and this is because we have four molecules two and two are kind of paired and look very similar to each other so we can see that the purple molecule here and the blue molecule are very similar looking and the two green molecules are very similar looking however in our volume metric we can still see differences between them we can still see there's a distinguishable gradient between the colors here. Whereas with our image metric, 
we see a lot of clouding. So we see uh, there's a lot of cloudiness and there's a lot of blurring in terms of the metric. And now why would that be? We took a look at the second moments or the diagonal entries of the second moments of each uh, molecule compared to our experimental uh, experimentally determined second moment. We can see that there are discrepancies between the empirical and analytical moments at high frequencies and at low frequencies. So we, this leads us to believe that we have a very biased moment estimator. And the second thing of note is that if we compare analytical moments, so this is 001 and 002, so those are the two molecules that are very closely looking, uh, closely alike to each other, and 003 and 004, so those are the other two molecules that are very closely alike to each other. We can see that the analytical moments are actually much closer together to each other than they are to the experimentally determined second moment. So we need to come up with better ideas uh, on how to unbias our moment estimator when we come to experimental data. And that leads us to some future work that we can do. So one of the main issues that we observe is that we have uncentered data and it heavily biases our moment estimation. How can we deal with this? Well, two ideas just to throw out. Well, first we can try to incorporate, try to estimate the distribution of shifts into our moment formula and then rederive the formulas and what they look like. And the second of which uh, we will need to find aspects of the moments that are invariant to shift. So maybe there are shift invariant aspects of the moments that we can use. So both of these are going to either limit amount of data that's available or require more data to solve for uh, more parameters. In the first case, if we try to incorporate a distribution of shifts, there are going to be more parameters we need to look for, which means that we might need more equations in our moment formulas. And the second uh, idea, when we try to look for shift invariant aspects of moments, this is going to limit the amount of information we have available because only a subset of our moments uh, are going to be shift invariant. And if we do it like this, we might have to rely on high order moments. And also both of these methods involve the use of carefully chosen bases. So as an aside, go over a couple of our bases that we're using. So this is twofold. One, because there's a basis expansion will help us deal with high noise and experimental. And uh, two, because uh, the bases that we use in dimensions relates to how we can calculate the second moment very fast. So if we consider just the 2D case here with images, we can define a standard basis expansion for an image. We have expansion coefficients AKQs and uh, basis functions UKQs. And if we define this as a steerable basis function, and simply we'll uh, just break up the uh, basis function into a radial function times an angular and why is this nice? Well, it builds with rotations nicely. If we rotate by alpha, then what happens is we just need to multiply our original expansion coefficients by this complex exponential. Now, what is the steerable basis we actually use in practice to calculate moments fast? This is going to be Fourier Bessel. And the key idea here is to just choose our radial component to be the Bessel function as described here. And we assume that we can get compact support on a disk of radius R0. And this is, uh, arises from the fact that molecules aren't infinite. We can just have our molecule uh, compactly supported because it's uh, not an infinite function. And the choice of uh, our radial function here to be the Bessel function is nice for several reasons. Well, first of all, it makes the basis functions orthogonal over the disk. Also, if we try to solve for eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, we naturally get these basis functions as a result. And then for the moments, uh, our second moment is going to be block diagonal on this basis. So this makes it easier to store. And when we deal with contrast transfer functions, it's diagonalized in this basis. So it deals with uh, the image formation model nicely. And we also have a three-dimensional analog for this. So we can recall that when we expand the Fourier transform volume into spherical harmonics, we're simply just sampling expansion coefficients at various radii. But we can actually expand this further by splitting up our expansion coefficients into 
more expansion coefficients times a uh, spherical Bessel function here. And similar to our 2D case, we get a similar niceness with rotations. And if we choose a good truncation of our ALM case using KL, we can deal with noise nicely, trimming off uh, parts that are more sensitive to noise. And now we actually have the tools to calculate this fast. When we were writing the paper earlier, uh, the earlier paper with metrics, we didn't have any tools for us to calculate these spherical Bessel expansion coefficients fast. Now we do. And the hope is that with these, we can create uh, moment formulas that are much more or much less sensitive to noise. And that is a, a, a aspect of future work. And uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Andy. Let us thank Andy for his presentation, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy. I'll stop the recording.